Dad of Jan Hicks Creates coming back at you with lesson number five. I'm gonna run out of fingers eventually. I'll have to be doing like Steph does with multiple stuff and math. But for now, I can do it on one hand. Lesson number five, today I'm gonna to talk to you about kidding up your own projects. It's a fairly straightforward process, not a lot to it, in my opinion. Um, so I don't expect this video to be too awfully long. Of course, I think I've said that in the past and it's been 45 minutes, so <laughs> we'll just see where we end up. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about the basics. Um, straightforward fabric floss, if you don't wanna change anything, how to recalculate your fabric, should you want a different, different fabric than what the pattern calls for, and at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about if you wanna change the suggested floss. And that's mostly if you wanna change it from the DMC, from the solid, to one of the variegated. So I'll kind of give you some tips on how I do it um, if you wanna go that route. So, I'm going to turn you around and we're gonna get started. Okay, so as a beginning cross-stitcher, you have probably worked on a chart or two, maybe some simpler things. Maybe you dove right in and bought a big pattern, a big chart, or a big kit with lots of threads. But maybe you're just still starting out with little stuff and you are ready to jump into the world of buying the chart separately and kitting up a project for yourself. I have a variety of patterns, a variety of de designers here in front of me. And the first thing you want to think about when you're ready to kit up your own project, in my opinion, is size. How big do you want it? Well, you can go with, the, the easiest thing to do is to go with what is suggested by the designer. So you can buy exactly the fabric used, exactly the, the floss used, and that's the easiest way to go about it. You don't ha really have to think about anything. But perhaps you wanna do these patterns, and the suggested fabric is 36 count linen, and you're not ready for 36 count lin linen. What do you do in that case? Perhaps there's a bunch of uh, variegated floss suggested, and you want to stick to the DMC for now. You don't want to get into variegated flosses yet. They are more expensive. So how do you handle that? Like I said, to begin with, you might just want to go, and the easiest way definitely is to go with just doing it as charted. But if you don't, let's look at any of these. Any of the designers, whenever they were, are writing up their instructions, they are always going to put the stitch count, and I mentioned this in my um, basics getting started video when we looked over what a chart is, dis is um, made up of. So they all have the stitch count, 63 wide by 81 high, 22 by 37. This one's a bigger one. It is 159 by 159. Again, stitched on a 36 count, the model that is. This is an old Blackbird, the Garden Club series. This is probably a linen as well. 32 count cocoa by Weeks Dye Works. So you can see there's kind of a trend here that a lot of the designers do use a linen. And they don't all necessarily tell you what your alternatives are for different sizes. Now this one in particular, this is the only one of my most recent purchases that actually gives you the different counts of fabric and what the finished size will be. So that's very helpful if you don't wanna to have to you know, figure that out yourself. But none of these other ones that I have here in front of me do that, they just give you the stitch count. So let's go ahead and look at the winter salt boxes. All right, so we know our stitch count is 63 wide by 81 high. How do we figure out, if we wanna use a 14 count Ada, how do we figure out what size, how much fabric we need? Well, we go to something called a cross stitch calculator. Now this particular one is on a f website called Yarn Tree. There are many different ones out there. This is one of the more well-known ones. The one I actually like to use is in an app 
called X-Stitch. I have the paid for the subscription version, X-Stitch Plus, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. I do have a video showing how to use this. This is basically an inventory keeping app and also kind of a journal, but it does have a tools function. So you have a shopping cart and a calculator. And the calculator has all the information. And it's basically any, any fabric calculator you come across out there is going to have the same type of information, the same, the same fields to fill in. So I'm gonna use the one on Yarn Tree just because this is the one that is most readily available to people if you don't have the X-Stitch app. So let's look at this. Graft side, stitches wide by stitches high. So this is where you put in this 63 wide by 81 high. And be very careful that you are seeing those dimensions correctly. For the most part, everyone does width by height. Width, the width is the first number, height is the second number. I have had one in particular, Modern Folk Embroidery, where they he, he put the height first and that, then the width, and I did not catch it. And so when I did the calculation, I had my fabric the wrong way, basically. So always double check that you are width height, width height. Fabric count. We're gonna go with 14 count Ada. When you're using Ada, as it says, Ada is one, linen is usually two, so we're gonna leave that one. Now, fabric, extra fabric on each side for the border. What this is referring to is how much fabric you wanna have showing before you get to the frame. So here's the finished part of the design. The frame is over here. How much border you want, how much fabric you want showing before you get to the frame. They have two inches. That's an awful lot of fabric. I don't usually like that much. I'm gonna put a half an inch. Extra fabric on each side for finishing. What this means is anytime your piece is finished, if it's in a frame type situation, you wanna have enough fabric that wraps around whatever that stitched piece is being mounted on, some kind of foam core or mounting board. You wanna have enough fabric to wrap around that it can either attach if they're using um, acid-free tape, if it's being laced. However, the framer that you've chosen is doing it, there needs to be enough fabric on the back that it can really hold the piece in place. Many, many designers and many, many people you talk to will recommend three inches. Three inches used to be the standard if you were using mats before, you know, the, the mats on the front to frame your piece before, you know, the frame part. Oops. Um, mats aren't as popular today as they used to be. And so I usually leave that at two inches. If I am short on, if I happen to have fabric in my stash and I'm short, I might decrease that down. I always look first and see, let's find a frame piece. See how the designer has framed it? You can see she has not left very much fabric for the border only like, looks like maybe a half, maybe a quarter inch, not very much at all. You really only need an inch, maybe a little more to wrap around the, around the back. I'm going to leave that two inches, but I'm just saying if you ever have a place, a point in time where you have fabric in your stash that you like to use and two inches, um, you don't have enough fabric for the two inch finishing number here, you're fine decreasing that to one inch. Just make sure you allow for both the border, the fabric here, as well as the fabric wrapping around the back. Okay, so now we're just going to hit calculate and it tells me the finished size, I remember we're working with one of these salt boxes, the finished size on 14 count Ada is four and a half by five and three quarters. The fabric you want is nine and a half by 11. So that's allowing on each side of the fabric this extra number of inches. 
And then this particular calculator also tells you what size tapestry needle you'd like to use, is commonly used for 14 count. Most people use two strands of floss and for back stitching if there is any one strand of floss. So this is a great calculator. And like I said, I will link that below. Again, anytime you wanna, you wanna calculate if, if the dimensions aren't given. And even in, um, for this one, this is telling you the finished size. It is not telling you how much fabric you need. So you might wanna come in here and put the numbers in for this one and do the calculations with that extra fabric, these two fields here, so you can be sure you're getting enough fabric. So if I wanted to put in a, a linen, I still have my my width and height there, but let's say I want to um, work on a 30, let's say I want to work on a 40 count linen, where as you have the number of threads that the X covers is one for Ada, as it says here for linen, it is usually two. So we're gonna change that to two and I'm gonna keep everything else the same, calculate size, and you can see the stitched area decreased by an inch or so, and the fabric you need decreased. And then it changes what it's suggesting to use down here. So as you're looking at a pattern, you are going to decide how big you want it. You can see what her finished size is on here. Does she actually say that? Yeah, not all of them do, but, um, yeah, so none of these actually say what their finish, none of these other ones say what their finished size are. So let's go ahead and look at this one again. You can look and see what the finished sizes are on this one. If it's not given, then you're gonna to wanna to do these calculations because you might be thinking, I want this to be a smaller piece. I want it to fit in such and such an area. The finished size at 14 count seems a little big. Let me go down to 16 or 18 count Ada and see what the sizes are there. So, and perhaps you have a piece of fabric in your stash. Let me see if this will fit on this piece of fabric. So um, I would say pretty much any time I am starting a project, I am going to my cross stitch calculator. So. Like I said, I will link this below. You will get to know this tool very, very well. And as I said, the, um, the X-Stitch app that I use, I do, like I said, I do have a video of it, of explaining how to use it. I'm just gonna talk about it real quick here. It is, to get the full version, it is a $9.99 yearly subscription fee. I find it more than worth it. I keep everything in here charts, threads, linens, beads. This is very handy because it does, actually it keeps you from buying double. It lets you know if you're out shopping and you can see so many different types of thread and they have them all in here. So you basically are going in and all the different DMCs, the different types and entering what you have and how many skeins you have of each. So if you're out shopping and you pick up a pattern, you can look at your app and see if you already have that color in your inventory. Perhaps you're just building your stash and you don't have it yet. Um, perhaps you're working on building your stash and you can see what you have. The paid for version gives you more um, space for charts, more space in your journal. It also allows the information to sync across devices. It stores it in the cloud. So I have this app on both my phone and my iPad, so I can put the information in my iPad, and then when I'm out shopping, I have my phone, and all the information is in there. The journal section, you can see wish list, kitted, started, finished. So if I have a chart in my inventory, and I decide I want to start it. I can just hit this little journal, whoops, not the picture, this little journal button here, and that takes me over to the journal and I can put in all the information, as well as the start date, I can finish date, and what I'm using. So it really keeps 
everything and you can see it allows pictures it allows up to five pictures per, per project so it really helps to keep everything in one place and um allows you access to your inventory just on the fly and like i said it does have these tools so the calculator and the shopping cart as you're going through your thread list you can see if you don't have anything, you can click a little shopping cart icon and it'll put it in here so that when you're out shopping, you can access that. So again, very handy. And I will link the video that I've done on it so that it's a little bit slower and more in depth. So let's talk about then, we have um, decided on our fabric. And again, you may decide to stick with the color that the designer suggests and whether you are stitching on ada or stitching on linen even if the designer suggests linen oftentimes the um the fabric or the company that they're using dyes their range of colors across both their ada and their linen so you should be able to find the colors that have been used in Ada as well. There are some of the more, um, I would say, obscure companies that that may not be true, but you can probably find something similar. Now, what if you wanna change everything? So, or what if something isn't suggested? That's always fun too. Let me find, I have to admit, I haven't kept up very well with um, with my um, with my inventory in here with my journal, but if you have a design, let's look at this one by Sue Hillis. So number one, fabric. You may or may not change the fabric. Most of the time you're going to stick with a fairly neutral fabric for pretty much anything. I mean, she uses a pretty gray. You may not use this exact color gray. You may decide something else. It takes a little while, I would say, to become oh, maybe bold enough to start changing colors. This sweet one by Abby Rose. She uses a fairly mottled fabric in this. Let's see what this fabric is. This is picture this plus Wren. You may not like it to be fairly that modeled. You may like it more modeled. You might like it to be more of a pink to go with all the other pinks or maybe more of a green to set off against the pinks. There are different ways you can go. And as you get more comfortable with stitching and with your inventory and with all the possibilities out there, I think you will find that you'll start branching out. Now, oftentimes I hear that people feel like they are doing the designer a disservice, a disservice if you're changing up something like the fabric or the colors. I would say for the most part, designers are thrilled to see that kind of creativity, to see us, the stitcher, get inspiration from what they've done and add our own special twist to it. I don't think there's any designer out there who would feel slighted because you wanted to put your own personal touch on a pattern. So don't ever feel that it's not right, that it's the wrong thing to do. Again, there's very few rules in cross stitch and rules were made to be broken. Now, are there times that you do not want to change a pattern? I would say if you are in love with how it looks, why would you change it, right? Go with what the pattern the designer did. But if there are things that you're thinking, eh, I don't know, I think I could change something, I'm not sure about that, then feel free to change it. Or, like I look at this and I think, maybe I don't have the particular red that she calls for for this house but I do have a lot of red from one of the other hand dyers. I would use that, as long as it was similar, because I do like how this looks. 
Um, so that's the kind of thing you think about. I would look through my stash, if I didn't have these colors of these little houses here, I would look through my stash and say, well, that, that blue that I have is similar to that, and that, that light blue is similar, you know, that kind of idea. If you like how it looks, but if it's, you know, these are all gonna be the variegated, the, the over-dyed flosses, and you don't wanna go out and buy more, you have a nice stash, look in your stash and see what you have that might be similar. Now, let's talk about if something is charted in DMC. I look at this, and this is Sue Hillis's latest Home for the Harvest. Love, love, love it. But I look at this, and, and she has it charted. I'm going to try and show this because she has patterns on each page as well. She has it charted in both DMC and Sullivan's. I have the DMC, you know, I have the full line, but when I look at all of the solid stitching in a single color, that the browns in this truck, the oranges, and she does have a lot of shading here, I look at that and think, I bet you ha I have an over dyed that would make this more interesting. And that's what I would do. I would go to my, my collection of over-dyed flosses and see what I have that's similar that would work. And it might change the look slightly, but that's okay because I'm staying true to what the designer intended while still putting my own little spin on things. Hope that makes sense. Again, it's something that maybe you're not comfortable with to begin with. But as you go on and as you stitch more, and as you realize there aren't any rules, there aren't any cross-stitch police, you are free to use what you want because it is, you're, you're pleasing yourself. Then I would say go for it. Or even if, you know, this white truck is really sweet, but if you want to change it to, change it to red, why not? Find a great variegated. This might actually be two shades of um, a white in here. Find a couple of shades of red and change it up. I encourage you to be creative. When you have something like, unfortunately this is a very small picture, but when you have something like um, a design that is, is charted in one color, I encourage you to think of ways you could change that to bring in other colors. Perhaps you do it all in one color, but just add touches of another color for spots of color. There are different ways that you can change things to make it your own that aren't necessarily changing the whole thing. Now, I did start to say, how do you know what not to change? Say you decide you really like changing things up. How do you decide what not to change? I would say something like um, a sampler. I don't know that I'd change. Well, I don't know. If there's a big house and I had, it called for a certain color of silk and I had a different color, I might change that. But for the most part, I don't know that I'd change the colors of a sampler. Um, of course, full coverage designs. I wouldn't mess with the colors on a full coverage design. But, um, I think pretty much anything else is fair game. <laughs> but I'm very comfortable changing things, and I encourage you to do that too. So that's really, you know, once you get your fabric picked out, once you choose your floss, I did want to mention um, floss. I encourage you as a beginner, if you're only starting to build your inventory, that you um, go to Joann's, go to Michael's when they're having sales. They do have sales periodically. 30, 40% off, and, and build your inventory through those sales. I do try to support my local shops as much as possible, but they aren't making money from the floss. They're making money from the charts and the fabric. And the floss, you know, that might be one of the cheaper options, but if you have a lot to buy, take advantage of those sales. All right, I think that is about all. Like I said, it's a pretty straightforward process. You have your fabric, you have your floss, start stitching. Next week, I plan on 
talking in depth about variegated. Variegated floss, over dyed floss. And my plan is to show you samples of the different ways to stitch with them. Talk about the different types of variegated floss and how that makes a difference in how you stitch with them. And just give you a thorough introduction into variegated floss and how to use them. So again, I hope you found this helpful. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And I will see you next week. Bye-bye.